Okay, looks like we've got a good critical mass of people here now and it's a little bit after three o'clock. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Um, today's, um, well, welcome to our talk today. This is um, the, a celebration of World Water Day, mapping the connections among indigenous people. Um, I'm Ann Hanlon. I'm the head of the um, UWM Libraries Digital Humanities Lab. Uh, and we're really, really pleased and excited to um, be a co-host for uh, today's talk. Um, and uh, along with the um, uh, the School of Freshwater Sciences, the Center for Water Policy, uh, and the Electroquinney Institute. So thank you. Um, just quickly, the UWM, for those of you who aren't familiar, because I know we have a lot of new people here, um, the UWM Libraries Digital Humanities Lab um, is itself a collaborative space, um, both physical when we can be and virtual, um, where we investigate how digital tools and methods can support and extend research and teaching in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. And so we're especially interested in what Margaret um, and Stacy and Lacey have to tell us today. So um, just a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with, with um, Zoom presentations at this point, but we just ask everybody during the talk to just stay muted and keep your cameras off. Um, and then um, you can use the chat to, uh, to um, post questions. I'll keep an eye on the chat uh, and then we'll do Q&A at the end of today's talk. Um, so, um, so we'll kind of save the questions for then, but I'll keep an eye on them uh, for you. All right. Um, and, and oh, and one last thing, we're recording today's session, just FYI. Uh, so this uh, recording will be um, available at a later date. Okay. Well, then I'm going to introduce Melissa Scanlon. Um, Melissa is the um, uh, chair and director of the Center for Water Policy here uh, in UWM School of Freshwater Sciences. Um, she's a professor in the School of Freshwater Sciences, and she's also affiliated faculty at UW-Madison's Law School. Um, she joined UWM this January, and so we're thrilled, like I said, to be partnering with Melissa and the Center for Water Policy um, and the Electric Quinney Institute to bring you today's discussion. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to um, make introductions. Thanks, Ann. Do you want to advance the slides? So the Center for Water Policy was established in 2011 through an endowment from Lyme to Lyme, And our mission is to provide interdisciplinary solutions to protect, restore, and conserve freshwater resources. We want to bring together science and economics with social sciences to inform policies that ensure long-term environmental health and quality of life. And the center builds on the research of the School of Freshwater Sciences, the UW system and networks and partnerships with top scholars, scientists and policy institutions across the country and around the world. Part of how the center operates is through a program for water policy scholars. And that program provides funding for one or more water policy scholars each year in order to increase the faculty capacity to address water policy issues. Uh, every year we open a, a request for proposals from faculty and we'll be posting the RFP in April uh, to choose who will be funding for the upcoming academic year. So today we're featuring one of our scholars in celebration of World Water Day. And World Water Day takes place every year on March 22nd. We're celebrating it early uh, because of UWM spring break next week. Uh, but a little bit about World Water Day. It celebrates water and raises awareness about the fact that there are 2.2 billion people living without access to safe water on this planet. And the theme changes every year. The theme this year for World, World Water Day 20. Uh, 21 is valuing water. So beyond economic issues, the topic of valuing water includes environmental, social, cultural value that people place on water. How we value water is reflected in the laws and policies that impact how clean our water is, how much it costs to use water, how open water is to the public. Um, it also influences what we map and whether we see indigenous cultures and governments in relation to water. So with our waters facing increased pressure, understanding the many different and competing ways to value this critical element becomes a key way 
to help equitably balance competing demands and interests and reach sustainable responses worldwide today and for many generations to come. So with that, I wanna to turn to introduce our project team uh, for this. And first I'll, I will introduce everyone and then I'll turn it over to the team to um, give their presentation. Um, first, Margaret Newton, she's the co-project leader. Dr. Newton served in, as the 2019-2020 Water Policy Scholar for our center. She is a professor and the director of the Electric Kony Institute for American Indian Education at UWM. She also writes poetry and songs in Anishinaabe Moan, uh, which appear in her books. And I'm gonna post in the chat a link uh, to her work so anyone who wants to learn more can see that. Um, next, Stacy Sheldon, she's also a co-project lead. She's the technical lead. And she's a user experience researcher and designer. She's a published author, a mentor, and American Indian language advocate. Uh, in her spare time, uh, she manages Ojibwe.net, which is where you'll see the map. And I will also post in the chat a link to her website. Uh, you see Willow Lavecki there. She's, she was a content manager on the project. Uh, she is a junior at UW-Madison. And she is not going to be speaking today, but we, we have her up there. Um, and then last, Lacey Meyer is a content manager on this project. Lacey is a junior at UWM, majoring in conservation and environmental science with a focus on water resor resources and ichthyology. She is also working on a certificate in American Indian Studies. So. Um, with that, please join me in welcoming our panel today. I guess I can begin and just say <laughs> boujou, Anin, everyone, and uh, Stacy is getting our slides set up here. We really appreciate everybody taking the time to learn about this project with us. It was an amazing opportunity to bring some scholars together and focus on the way we see our space. Can you see my screen? can see your screen. Yeah, we see the little ones on the side, but okay. it's fine. Yeah. That works fine by me. <laughs> you want to start up, start things off? Sure. Um, so, Chitwa Dwege Kwe, Indigenous Nishinaabe Mong. Ajijak Dodum, Sheboygan, Michigan, and Donjaba, Stacy Sheldon, Indigenous Cas. So my name is Stacy Sheldon in um, in English, and Ojibwe. My name is Chitwa Dwege Kwe. That means honored eat woman. And I am Crane Clan, and I'm originally from Sheboygan, Michigan. And I'm was really excited to work on this project. Um, Margaret and I have been working together now for. Uh, maybe 15 years on Ojibwe.net, and this has been one of the most um, fun and I think meaningful things that, that we've worked on. So I appreciate being here today to talk about this project. And I'll introduce myself and give Lacey the heads up that she can do that next. Uh, Minnesota and Dayak Nij Dan Sakwede Ann Arbor, Michigan, Eawak, Mina Apachiko, Anishinaabe, Jikoma, Mamwe, Anishinaabe. So I'm originally from uh, Minnesota and Chionagaming, Chijashko, Wede, Giwednong, Mina Montreal. I've got relatives from Graham Portage and Montreal, the Ontario Metis. My clan is. Pine Martin, and uh, it's just been a pleasure to be living in Milwaukee and teaching Anishinaabe when here. Uh, we've got a very high population of folks in this city working to revitalize the language, and six of the nations that we show on our map uh, are in our state. So here in Wisconsin, we're doing what we can. I have two daughters that are Gwingwaagek, they're Wolverines over there in Michigan. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to Lacey to introduce herself. Ani Nindishna Kaz Nora Nokwe, Nindonjaba Wasa, Ninda Shorwit, Nindawa Wajkasanyak. My name is Lacey. 
I'm from Wausau and I live in Shorewood and I'm Forest County Potawatomi. I'm a junior studying conservation environmental science with a focus on water resources and ecology. Um, I'm also studying GIS as part of my major, so it was just a really great learning experience for me, this whole project. Meg, do you want to talk about how the project came to be? Absolutely. So keeping in mind time, I will follow up on what uh, Melissa shared with us. It really was a great opportunity. Um, we're welcoming Melissa to Milwaukee now. This project started a little bit before she was here and Peter and Marilyn and others, um, all my friends down at Freshwater have always been very, very welcoming. Um, for me, I think all my work is really connected, but I think it appears to cross uh, humanities and the sciences, sometimes social sciences as well. That's always centered in the Great Lakes. My entire life, I've never had an opportunity to see our Anishinaabe nations and our linguistic and cultural diaspora on one map. Stacy and I have been talking about this from probably the very beginning as we talked about who our language uh, included, who are the other speakers. The word Ndenoe Maganak, which is the word for relative, it literally means those who sound like me. So this was an opportunity to create a map that not only showed the watershed, but showed our language and how those two things, the Great Lakes watershed and our language overlap. I will say that we had other folks involved. Um, you see on this slide, which to me is also a, a kind of amazing thing. Uh, when I was in college, I was very often the only person who spoke Ojibwe in the classroom or who was interested in these type of topics to bring together six, um, Stacy and I might be the Minamoyak, the uh, senior scholars here, and then we've got young new scholars who are going to take over this field to be able to work um, with a group of Anishinaabe speakers. Every one of these people um, has studied a little bit at least or quite a lot of the language and it's really just been a joy to see everyone come together and be able to map our, our diaspora this way. We had our kickoff meeting. I put a note here, December of 2019. And we had our, this is a note here from our, that we took at that first meeting. And when we were trying to conceptualize this map and what it would mean for everybody, because for, in my field and user experience, I always wanna know like, who is this for? And what is the impact it's gonna have? Um, and so our purpose was to visualize our tri tribal diaspora across, you know, we don't really honor that boundary between the U.S. and Canada as far as our, um, the tribes go, with an interactive map that also shows the watershed. This was really conceptual at the time. It would be viewable by the broader public, um, and it would help us to understand our connections to each other. And it would have this power that would come from um, these connections with each other to address climate change, algae blooms, and all these other things that are impacted by the Great Lakes watershed. I think the, I left this in this presentation view that's a little bit funny because I have a lot of different windows, browser windows to bounce around to, but I think we wanted to talk first about the, um, the nation's map, which you have a preview of here. It looks, if you go to Ojibwe.net, you can access it from this page. Um, and it talks about on this page, the story behind the map, right? Like um, so a little history overview of the Great Lakes watershed. And then you can click to explore the map, but we also have some stuff about citations, how to submit um, additional information, which we're expecting a lot of feedback on. We have all of that, that gets you into the actual map itself which looks like this. And the map has all of the different nations on the left. And this works pretty well on mobile devices too, if you aren't on a computer. And a lot of hard work went into finding all of this information, right? This didn't exist. We weren't able to just pull this data from someplace it had to be compiled. So we have a live Google sheet that's connected to this map it has all these different fields in here. And Meg, I think I'll turn it over to you to talk about how we came to decide which elements to include in here and the work that went into those. Yeah, exactly. And again, like I'll give a little heads up, Lacey, I'll toss the ball your way in a minute here. Um, we really had to sit down and think about what we wanted to include. And uh, 
all of the fields here tell us something about what we consider to be a th the Three Fires Confederacy. So the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi are three ethnicities which are in the umbrella group, the Anishinaabek. And it really took a lot of work to contact each of these nations. Um, Lacey was actually at the ground floor of this, helping us figure out the comma, you know, which uh, columns are we gonna use, all of the, the data. And I guess maybe Lacey, if you wanna talk a little bit about the experience of trying to pull all that data together. I think the hardest part was trying to find what the nations were calling themselves. Cause there's a lot of like what other people refer to um, certain nations in their own ways. Um, Another part was a lot of them are grouped together with the same name, but in different locations. The other part was also trying to find exact locations of where they were found specifically in where their location was and where their mailing address was. Cause those sometimes were two different places, making sure that we had those exact locations. It was a lot of coming through information and I found out a lot of information about the different nations, just reading through their website, trying to find, find their name, find out where they want to be, where they came from. It was actually quite educational in different Ojibwe nations. So I know a lot more about other peoples through the process. Meg, is there anything else you wanted to say about the translations? Uh, you know, I guess it would just be, I hope that everyone that's on this call, it just goes and pokes around because if you look at that map, you see two things. You see the political names that are on treaties and many times a, a nation will retain their political identity as was given to them by the government. So you find people who say they are, you know, the Chippewa or the Ojibwe spelled in a very anglicized way because that's the legal name that they use to interface with other governments. But when you look at the name that they have been known by in, over time that's in Anishinaabe when you start to see that those names more often re reflect features of the land. And so it really is important to kind of learn both because if we want to pull together in the Great Lakes area and understand how to best steward all of the waters that are connected in this space, to think about it from that perspective. Um, there are, a good example is Sheboygan. We have a Sheboygan, Michigan, a Sheboygan, uh, Wisconsin. We have um, many words that echo across the landscape like this and Sheboygan means to go across. So when you start realizing this was a space you might go in say Michigan to cut across that what is now thought of as the upper part of the lower peninsula, you go from Sheboygan, Michigan to Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and you start to think about that space a little bit differently. So it, it helped us allow people to see that and to uh, share those identities that tribes have maintained, I think. And along the same lines of what Lacey was saying, we have tribes that have federal recognition, tribes that are in the process of getting federal recognition, tribes that um, are historically in an area, and there really was a lot of hard decisions about what to include on this map. I think that came up a few times as to whether or not they were federally recognized and whether or not we are going to include them on the map. Yeah, and it's nice that it was created for people, and maybe this is Stacy's terrain, she can jump in, but we really had quite the journey of um, merging various software platforms and various ways of presenting things because we knew we wanted to keep it simple enough for anyone to access and use even on a mobile device. But we wanted the complexity of them seeing multiple languages, having filters by the various ethnicities that we include in the group. And it was important to be able to change it. So I have several times given talks in other venues and I will have someone in the chat say, but what about my nation? It's actually a part of this other one. I'd like it separated. And then they send me the link to their tribal home office and we're able to go right in there and I can change it real time and update it so that we are always getting the most accurate version. For those who are maybe popping in and looking at it on your browser, um, our, our total nations now hovers around 140. And there are a few debates whether a couple of them in Canada should be counted as one because their treaty areas are handled differently. 
but we're able to record that live as we meet people from all of these nations. And that's certainly something, when I grew up in Minnesota, we just had the one view of things there. Um, we didn't see ourselves as part of this whole diaspora in this way. So it's really powerful to see those conversations take place. I think as a student, it was really nice. We talk about how big the Ojibwe population is, but to be able to see it across the map and see that it's more than just this little area that in my mind that I've lived with my whole life to see it all the way across is really visually a lot. <laughs> And one of my favorite parts of working on this was finding all the logos. <laughs> I think an interesting research project would just be comparing all of those across um, the all the Anishinaabek nations and seeing how they vary um, and are similar to each other. But I think our next slide here was, Willow was gonna talk about, and Megan, I don't know if you wanna fill in for her, sort of her work that she did on sure. defining the watershed. Yeah, we talked a lot about who, like you said earlier, who's the audience for this map. So some of it is people who are members of these nations wanting to connect with each other. Some of it is people who are in policy making areas. They are in areas deciding about various laws. They are people who work for state or provincial uh, departments of natural resources. So to see the watershed uh, as an entity, as a living entity, and present it that way and show this group as stewards of this space was pretty important. So Willow spent a lot of time uh, finding the latitude and longitude of all the edges of the watershed and learning how using uh, GIS techniques we can show more information. Like all of us, she came away saying, oh, we, we need more filters. There's more we could say because she saw the power of showing the watershed and the way the tribes connect with it um, differently. So we've got another project that we're currently working on where we'd like to take a look at parts of this map and some other ways that we can view the nations and the landscape and show those connections. So really that mapping of the accurate scientific borders that we all see and the cultural borders was what, what Willow focused on. And next we wanted to talk a little bit about the technical aspect of all of this and I, I won't dwell on this very much except for to say it all seems very simple now in retrospect having this google sheet connected to everything and all the decisions being made but it didn't feel like that at the beginning um, and I had here's my first bullet excitement and trepidation and part of that was it felt a little overwhelming how to make it happen and the funny part about this that I just like to tell this is I'm not a map person when I'm outside, I'm all about what I'm seeing. Um, and this is a picture here of my cousin who's six and my dog. And she's actually holding a magnet in her hand that she's pretending is a, a phone that she's using to find our way out of the woods. <laughs> but in contrast, Margaret loves maps and writes poetry around maps. And so we've always, we've always had a good partnership. And I think this is one of the ways in which it manifests itself. But when I started off, Ajubui.net lives on a WordPress platform, and so we tried finding plugins that match that. Um, and the sort of the best one that we came up with was um, ended up being Russian software. And so every time I had trouble or needed help, I would have to write to them and then wait essentially 24 hours or more for a response, right? Because of the time zone differences, um, and it was just really difficult to make things work. We ended up eventually finding, I was looking at, I wish we could have something like Mapbox. Mapbox is a huge company that drives major transportation services. And we happened to stumble across while we were searching one day that they actually have a whole branch of their organization that's meant that wants to partner with nonprofits and other sort of social impact organizations to do work with them. And I included a photo here of Marina Brinkhurst from Mapbox and her job is actually to facilitate those partnerships. And so she ended up being this wonderful resource for us. She helped us get through, um, or she helped me get through some of the technical hurdles of what's getting set up on GitHub so that we can share our code essentially with the community and getting our map up and running. And she's continuing to help us with some of the other pieces of that. So. Um, if anybody has questions about the technical aspect, um, please let me know, though I assume this is kind of the least interesting part of things. But we wanted to show, um, to talk about that, and then we had some, we have next steps and future plans. And Meg, I'll turn it over to you to talk about 
this slide. Yeah, and you know, I guess I'm mindful of time here. I wanna make sure we leave uh, time for questions at the end. And I believe that our Digital Humanities Lab will have this presentation available or could afterwards. So I maybe won't dwell on this a lot. I think that uh, really finding ways, we have had even more suggestions beyond what you see on the list here from nations that we've met or talked to more because we've reached out to help them, you know, kind of reclaim their own name in the language or connect uh, their identity across the, what we see as the Canada and U.S. border in a lot of classrooms, a lot of ways that people think about this space politically to really encourage people to erase that border sometimes and work from a different perspective. So many people have reached out and told us how it was helpful. So maybe what I'll do is just leave that here and I'm sure everybody found it important or useful to tune in has their own idea of how they might use it. We had a whole other component of what we wanted to do because things tend to like grow, right? As you get ideas about things. And we, we saw some of the work that was being done around story maps. And I don't know if, if any of you are, you know, if all of you are familiar with those, but I have really expensive taste. So I, I stumbled across this one that's very professionally done. Um, and I loved it and I thought, I wish we could have something like this. Um, but this one is about the Dutch trade in black people. And as, we, as you scroll down this page, what you'll see is it's connecting the map to the story of, of slave trade. And there's a lot of great information here and it's showing you the routes that people took. And as you're just scrolling, it's telling the story um, you know, visually. And sometimes um, examples of these have videos and other media in them. But we wanted to have a go at creating something like this to tell the story of the Great Lakes watershed. And at the same time, Margaret was teaching a class on Western Great Lakes American Indian life. Uh, and Meg, I'll turn it over to you to talk about our work with the students. Sure, so what we did, we have a class that is within the American Indian Studies program here at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and it focuses on the Great Lakes. And uh, for a long time now, I've taught that with a very um, limnology focused uh, beginning. So what we do is we start out talking about what happened when the ice receded and, and these great lakes as a single living entity became a part of this continent in the way that they are now. And then where did human and other, you know, animal and plant life uh, grow up surrounding that space? So we talk about uh, the research that's, that is, the research that's been done to show Lake Huron was two lakes. We talk about how the stories, the uh, creation stories, and the things that are um, remembered orally about this space connect to the science. So what we wanted to do was be able to go kind of through that class and give students a way to connect to the watershed through mapping and storytelling at the same time, I guess is really um, the thing that we did. So we let students kind of experience this. So for other folks who are teachers in a sort of digital space, now that COVID has forced all of us to be in a more digital space, what I think I would take away from this is that in some ways students can help build spaces like this, um, especially having Lacey and the other students involved helping us find the data was really important because Lacey's taken the time to learn the language and was an amazing you know, person to be able to gather that info and, and talk to the tribes when we reached out. But for some of our students, this whole idea of mapping and stories and history as story was really new. And we had to kind of unpack that a little bit here. You see a few quotes about what a story map is. Um, and like I said, in, in the interest of time and leaving space for questions, um, we can kind of go through, so, through these a little bit quickly, but students had to start thinking about what we were teaching. When we talk about creation stories, here where we are in Wisconsin, we have to keep in mind there are um, Ho-Chunkra creation stories, Menominee creation stories, Potawatomi creation stories, uh, Ojibwe stories. There isn't just one story. And to be able to help them conceptualize these multiple identities in the same space they would often um, like help us pick some images out and help us kind of see how students might see a map like this. So this is a map that we are still working on, but it really showed me ways to move into digital humanities and engage students differently in the content that we had in that class. 
one of the things that we did was we built a pretty complicated prototype with our ideas, um, which you can't, you're supposed to scroll, but you have to click. But it it's a way for us to like figure out what we wanted to talk about, how we want the, the map to lay out. So starting off with what is the Great Lakes watershed and talking about some of those creation stories and which ones we would include or how do we include, how do we represent everybody, um, splitting that up east and west and so forth. Um, and then we wanted to talk about, we have plans to talk about the clans, clan relationships and the relationship to the watershed. And then sort of how, then the emergence of the fur trade and the, the disruption, it's kind of a pivotal point for the Great Lakes watershed. And so how that, how things were being moved out of the Great Lakes into Europe. And how the nation started to emerge and change and juggle borders. But this is really um, ambitious. You know, we had looked at some of those other story maps we showed. So we're we're working on this, and where we're at right now is a little simpler. Like we have the bare bones of the story map up on GitHub right now, and you can scroll and see. Like we want to um, this Anishinaabe region story. We're we're using the map to pinpoint talking about the east, the east first, and Madeline Island. Um, and then moving over to the Ho-Chunk. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep working on this. We have a similar spreadsheet set up with our, our data points, but this one is definitely still a work in progress. Um, and then we have our addresses here if people wanted to follow up with questions or anything like that, but I think then we wanted to have people to have time to ask questions and have some discussion. Okay, well, thanks everybody. This is fantastic. Um, let's see, I don't have, uh, have any questions in the chat yet. Let me pull that back up. Um, but people are welcome to post some questions in the chat. Um, I wanted to ask if I could, <laughs> um, since there's nothing in the chat yet. Um, so, you know, this is fascinating and there's so many like literally layers to the project um, that you're doing um, and it's still ongoing. This is something obviously that you're still building. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, how the nations have responded in terms of, you know, being able to not just contribute to, but also use the, the map that, and, the, and the stories that you're creating. Yeah, um, I'll say one thing kind of overall, and then Lacey, if you would want to talk about what it sort of means to find the name for the Forest County group and to have that on there. Um, I have had so many people say that it was the first time they saw a map connecting both the US and Canadian nations. And so we have groups in each state in the US that um, create alliances between sovereign nations. And in Canada, there is a large Anishinaabe group that is the leaders of each of the Anishinaabe nations, but there have not been any groups that really pull them all together. So as I've talked to folks, um, literally one day we met with one person who really broke down how the treaties had worked in, especially Treaty Terri Territory One, um, there have been folks that told us how up in the Manitoba area, when you're sorting out multiple nations, um, how they've even shifted their own way of seeing their identities. So it's a, a living map in a lot of ways where we can help folks see themselves in a, a network, not just as one point on a map. Or I guess nations are often taught to see themselves with the state or province in the background. And this refigures that. It situates them within their own diaspora. So it's not just there are six Ojibwe tribes in Wisconsin, there are six of 141 Ojibwe or Anishinaabe nations in the Great Lakes. It's a very different kind of picture. But I don't know, Lacey, do you want to talk about how, you know, for me, it, it's people know we've reclaimed, we stopped saying Winnebago, Winnebago, Winnebeek means the darker waters. Winnebago was the name that the Anishinaabe gave the Ho-Chunkra people. And at a certain point, the Ho-Chunkra said, you know, we were going to go by Ho-Chunk again. And I think that some nations haven't had as much opportunity to hear their names. I mean, I don't know, Lacey, do you want to just talk about how we, we did some research and did more discovery with the Forest County Group? 
Yeah, for me personally, I didn't grow up around my own people and we were always just taught, you know, we're Forest County Potawatomi. That's our band. That's those are my people. And as we were going into the process of finding out names that the, the nations and tribes were taking upon themselves, for me, it was very empowering to to translate Wedge Kasenyak, which is people of the uh, cold people of the north. And for that's very empowering for me, for someone who didn't grow up, it gives me a link to my people in a way that I never knew existed, having um, having an actual like name for it that comes from the language and gives me a better connection and being able to see that on a map and give us a place and, I, and an identity that belongs to us in our own is, it's, uh, it's part of one of the highlights of my academic careers, being able to see that and see it come to fruition in a whole project. And I hope that my, my part of it gives that feeling to somebody else to see their name in their language and what, those, what their people are calling themselves and to take that back. Great. Well, we've got some questions coming in from, um, and I think you answered Marina's question, um, and uh, from Amanda Seligman, although we can come back to it, Marina, if you, if you want to add to that. Um, Amanda um, says, I'm surprised at how hard you had to work to find all the nations and their contact information. Are there examples in North America of federations of indigenous peoples or have the linguistic connections been impeded by the structure of recognition by the U.S. and Canadian governments? Yeah, I would say that in many ways, um, the original names were not recorded in the way that you would hope. And so there are some nations that we still don't actually list an Anishinaabe word name because when the community was broken up, the area that they were assigned, they were given a name that was completely um, in a colonized framework. So to get back to place names in the original language, was in some cases really hard. And it was, it was a, a reminder of how much language has been lost. However, I would also say having worked with many other nations, it was a real reminder of how lucky we are within the Anishinaabe diaspora to have some nations where we do have immersion schools, we do have fluent speakers and to be able to connect them was really amazing because there were a few people when we reached out and said, we only see an English name listed for you. We've done a little digging and we see this name near where you are on a map from say 1750. Does this work for you? Does this fit or resonate with any stories? Some of them said they had not seen those maps. And so then we shared what we were finding, but we could see that there really had been a, a you know disruption of the oral tradition. To Amanda had asked too, like, are there examples in North America of federations of indigenous peoples? Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of those, even here in Michigan, there's the Michigan Intertribal Council. So you'll have, uh, you know, leadership from each of those bands working together. Um, and I, I suspect there's other organizations. Yeah, um, in, yeah in Wisconsin, we've got the Great Lakes Intertribal Council. That's what the Wisconsin one calls itself, <laughs> which we all just call glitzy. Um, but then there's also Glyph Wick. There are, I mean, I can pause and put a few of those in the chat too. There are groups that do try to um, represent a shared view, but uh, not as many as we would hope. There is in each nation as well, representation at a federal level. So we have the you know, National Congress of American Indians in the US that also you know, gives visibility to the policy needs for all of the nations. But that's a very large group and it crosses many linguistic and cultural diasporas. This kind of focuses in on one. Uh, we've got a question that I think that, that um, connects more to the, the climate change kind of um, implications of what you're putting together. So with COVID-19, um, I guess, uh, fleshing out human settlement contamination, um, is the resulting cleaner environment going to be a thread among stories of the present? I'll take that and see if anyone wants okay. to add, but I hope that what I can set up are some research projects where students like Lacey get out there and we do some studying with say, 
you know, I can imagine the humans who go out on boats that we know, um, Carmen and Russell do a lot of really good work. Um, Dr. Cool and Dr. Aguilar do incredible work on measuring the water um, and the changes we're seeing. But and I, I wish we could also have conversations with that beaver that's got a lodge up on Kinnikinick now. You know, we can go onto that river and see that that beaver and that type of life is coming back. So um, really, for us to pull more indigenous researchers into this work, I think could be one of the biggest things for climate change because people in the nations were really fighting things they saw harming the environment. And what I see post COVID is everyone getting a taste of what it's like when things stop and become a little more silent and there's a little more space for recovery and healing. And maybe now we can all work toward that together. I don't know if Stacy or, or Lacey have something they want to add on that. We're ready to do the research with you, Margaret. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. I think for someone who is studying water in particular, the whole COVID and everybody trying to stay home, the less people are using their cars and the buses and the transportation and just the general environment pollution that happens in bigger cities. For me, it was definitely something that crossed my mind and the impact that that would lead to in people and in our environment, either both short term and long term. Um, it definitely cro it's crossed my mind and I would love to see the research that's eventually going to come from that, if not contribute. Yeah, I guess to just um, connect some of these comments and maybe there's other questions this relates to is for all of us, we've often had the experience of folks coming to us saying, how do I connect with your nation or your people or your community? And it often feels a little bit like a one-off. You know, people want, they, they recognize it's good to do a land acknowledgement and they wanna do it and they wanna get it right. By having this map out there, people who might be working on the Fox River can literally see where are the nations near that? Where are the other nations in the watershed that are, are in the part of the watershed that I care about? So it's less about the legality of looking back chronologically in time to see who owned the land and more about going to a map like this and seeing who's currently sharing stewardship with it. All of us in Milwaukee, for example, should know, you know, the Ho-Chunk Menominee and the Fudge Ksenia, I mean, definitely have a big influence on how this bay where we're living now has been maintained. And if we have maps like this that show they are still connected to this space, it really, I think, can start to shape conversations differently. Um, and I'm well, leaving you to manage the question. Oh, I, I know. I'm, <laughs> well, we've got one from Nicole, um, Nicole Bungert in the libraries. Um, and she's asking about, um, would love to hear more about the emotional experiences of doing this work um, and your reflections on how it feels to have, to see the map completed or near, working on that. <laughs> to see the map alive, I guess. Right, alive, yeah. <laughs> changing, right, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll let maybe Stacy and, and Lacey take that because for me, it was really about being able to work with them to see it happen, but they might have other things to say. That this question provokes for me this like kaleidoscope essentially, because I think I mentioned we kicked this off in December of 2019. And earlier that year, Josephine Mandaman, who is a Nishnabe elder, who is a survivor of the residential schools, Canadian residential schools, she was known for carrying a copper kettle of water around the Great Lakes in their entirety as an elder to draw attention to the how important water is and different things that were happening to it. She had passed away just um, earlier that winter, it's like January, February that year. Um, and then in June of that year, Meg, Margaret and I have a friend um, named Greg who lives in Fond du Lac and him and his, his family have been shot at while spearfishing, which is a treaty right. Um, and there was just like this, there's this profound racism and hatred that exists um, with water in these communities and access and rights to those. Um, and, and then all this language work around this map, right, which was so important to us of the impact of language revitalization on our youth and what it means for their future is like the thing that always keeps us going. It's like the thing that's behind the work on Ojibwe.net, it's like the future, the future generations. It's like all of this comes together. Um, that's such a good question, Nicole. I feel like to me, this is, you're always in the state of wanting 
wanting things to be better, to make a difference with those things. And this mapping project kind of pulled on the threads of all of those things. I, I agree. I think being able to tie in all the things that are important to me and see them come together in a project and work with with other people that that means a lot to me. Uh, Margaret is uh, my professor and she's taught me a lot about the Ojibwe culture and the language and being able to go through the process of of helping other Native tribes and give them an identity that they might have forgotten existed and seeing GIS in in a work in progress and being able to see what we're able to do with that and add on top of the fact that I'm studying water and seeing it all comes together is very, it's, it's amazing. It's been a huge, like for me, emotional thing in my academic career. It's, it's really nice to see how all the things that interest me and are important can tie together in one project and can mean something to other people as well. Um, and we have a question or a comment and a question from from Lane Hall. Um, I love to see how much Ojibwe.net is growing and has grown. Uh, do you see that this map can be used in broad political campaigns that make us rethink political boundaries, um, such as the Enbridge Line three um, and five struggles going on right now? Uh, I, Stacy, you want to take that one? I was thinking you probably. I was just, that's that's our dream, right? Is that yeah. <laughs> that this map will be used to help facilitate those conversations, to offer a different perspective, to help people have a foundation for how they're seeing how they're seeing the watershed or those resources and the broad impact that those decisions are going to make. It's beyond just one town or community. It's like this whole network of of relations. So that would be yes, we would love that. Um, and we'll have to see like, how do we help make that happen? But that was one of the, the reasons why we made the map. Yeah, we try to build a linguistic um, and cultural foundation, a set of resources that people can use to just empower holistic healing in whatever community they're in. And that might mean that we get more you know, native students to study the areas that interest them and to be connected to the sciences. So we've always struggled um, to have native students complete college. I think since the boarding school era, that has been a challenge for us to just have instances of indigenous frameworks and ways of thinking being accepted in an academic environment leads us to have folks in these conversations about policy and politics in a more equal way. So it's not always just us them thing. It's really, how do we start this dialogue? If you wanna protest a pipeline, there's a quick way to understand where the pipeline going through your community. You can see on a map like this, who are all the other communities that are affected and get in touch with them really quickly. One of the things, Maggie just kind of opened the door, I think a little bit for this too, is I find that people are always surprised to know that until the year 1990, it was illegal to teach um, or to publish works in our language. And so that wasn't that long ago. And I think that's always important to remember. So for me, like I was in high school when the first dictionary came out in Anishinaabe Moine. Um, and so now to have this map that's about sharing and teaching and understanding the language here, not that, you know, not that much farther out is really important to us too. Um, there's just so much work to be done for reclaiming what was damaged, what was lost or what was endangered. You know, and I would, I would say too, I appreciate the Center for Water Policy and a lot of my colleagues at UWM where the identity of our institution is connected. I mean, our institution lies between the Milwaukee River and the shores of Lake Michigan. So I really appreciate the ways our concerns have been able to shape projects. I wasn't told here you have to apply to do X, Y, and Z. We're going to give you really tight guidelines of what is going to be valuable. We really were allowed to take what we knew was interesting and needed in Indigenous communities and follow that through and create something that impacts, I think, the communities from their own perspective, not fits them into, you know, a, a different world, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that's, that's key. Um, I have a question from Melissa. Um, 
uh, she's, do, do, you see, uh, do you see the water as a unifying link similar to the language linkage? I see place as a unifying link, whether it's water or land. I think this is one of those rare things that's true across almost all American Indian cultures is that place is the most significant thing. Time is much less significant than place. I think water connects us to, you know, it's part of that, it's part of our place. That's a resounding yes. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know, what do you think, Lacey? I think this map in particular gives a great visual representation of how the Ojibwe nations have kind of conjugated around the water and the water shed areas. You can see that by the layers, just that's the purpose, point of the map, right? One of the purposes of it. But I think one of the things that drove me into my studies was feeling that you know, water and our surrounding area, this, this is our, this is life. This is what gives us life. And part of the things that I want to do with my life is show other people that, that we're all connected. And I feel like this map does a great job of showing how closely we are interconnected as people and with our environment. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree. I mean, I think that the way that we research, people have heard me say this before, but I mean, some of when we dig into our um, ways of thinking and the patterns that we have, the word for lake is zaga'idan. The way you say, I love you is again. So that morphemic connection there means that this opening space is essential for having relationships. And just making that connection when we can show that here's this opening in the earth and this opening is an opportunity for all of us to connect and care for a space mutually. There are just other ways of thinking. And, and in this space, we also have the Ocheti Shikawan to the west, we have the Haudenosaunee to the east. We have overlaps and um, complexity that I think was erased when this nation was founded uh, rather quickly, and even though it seemed like a long couple hundred years and some hard couple hundred years, we always have an opportunity to, to move forward together differently. And so when we can show these other ways of seeing a space and caring for the water and treating the water as equal, um, that's another thing. Many of the nations are passing legislation within their sovereign nation that the water, land, and other living beings have equal rights to humans. Humans are, you know, if you're going to remove a whole species of plants, that's as significant as committing a mass murder of humans. Um, so I think that we're finding different ways to think about water and um, the rights of others in the space that we all share. I think in translation, uh, finding out how Breaking down the translations and what nations would call themselves, you could see that they were connected to their to the world just by what they were calling themselves. Mm -hmm. They were using where they were located, what was nearby, and like that's how they were identifying who they were as, as to what part of the world that they were playing in the world around them. And that definitely stood out with nations that didn't have an exact name that they were calling themselves and you were going through and seeing the translations of how they were breaking down what they were calling themselves, it really connects to their environment around them. Lacey, I see your assistant just showed up. <laughs> <laughs> we have to take a quick snack break. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's, I know we're like coming up on just like we have only five minutes or so left and I don't know if, um, Anne has more to say from a digital humanities perspective or Melissa has more to say from the Center for Water Policy. But I would also say that in these post COVID times, the way that we all work within our institutions of higher learning to connect um, those points of research that we all care about, that we know will move our scholarship forward, but that we know our communities are very invested in this was just a really good example of that as well, because Stacy is someone outside of our institution working in, in industry, um, but serving as a scholar within that space. And I think we've got a really good network here. Our, you know, the folks at the Electoquinney Institute, like Marina Paradise, who helped us make sure that this all actually got pulled off. I mean, it was a lot of collaboration. So I don't know, in some ways, um, you know, maybe I would be the, the last word also to, to Ann and Melissa to talk about how 
as we move forward in these post COVID times, how do we all do research together and uh, start thinking of interdisciplinarity and digital platforms as the norm, which I think is what we see happening in the world around us, not the exception. Yeah, I, th I think it's a fantastic um, example of, of a project that um, requires, you, that just demonstrates the power of collaboration um, and, and takes a lot of, um, you know, takes something, a map that we're used to seeing, you know, in a particular way that, you know, is often very, you know, politically charged and um, use and, you know, re-visualizes that. Um, it's a really powerful tool to use. Um, so I, I would agree um, absolutely, Margaret, that this is, um, you know, moving forward, if we want to solve big problems, we have to do it collaboratively. <laughs> um, and this is just a wonderful example. And I'll, I'll give the floor to Melissa to um, say have the last word. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, we can accomplish so much more through collaborations than in our individual silos, which is really the whole point of the Center for Water Policy and the, um, the scholars funding. So we're just thrilled to see this project come to fruition. And this has been really, I think, wonderful to hear from your whole team. I have a lot of gratitude uh, to all of you for uh, doing the hard work of helping us see this place in a different way, for helping us um, see the repair work that needs to happen with the languages and the, the loss of language that um, even through a mapping project, you're uncovering and helping stitch this back together, which is really tremendous work. And uh, I'm really, thrilled that the Center for Water Policy has played a small role in helping facilitate this. So, um, but with that, I wanna close it out and ask everyone, invite everyone to turn on your microphones and cameras if you'd like and give a round of applause to our speakers today. <laughs> keep spotting until I see my own picture come up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Great work. I Great guess work. Not. Fantastic. It Wonderful. Took a minute to turn Excellent. everything on. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for this. Great work, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, Jimmy Watch went in and Thank you. That was we great. got yet. Thanks to everyone for coming and listening. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you.